Today, I want to go over some of the times that owners made strange decisions on Kitchen Nightmares. Just like this time, when they butchered the hell out of this exquisite dish. This restaurant owner had an answer for just about everything Ramsay asked him. My biggest fear is, is the chicken. It just, it doesn't... It doesn't happen in here. And that's just one of the most controversial moments from the new season of Kitchen Nightmares. There were tons of issues at this place. First and foremost being, Bel Air Diner was the kind of place that had the audacity to pick an exquisite dish and butcher the hell out of it. I'm talking about the Cocao Vien, which is usually a feature on the best fine dining menus, and for good reason. There is nothing simple about this French delicacy. In fact, having something as exotic as Cocao Vien on a diner's menu is controversial in and of itself. Especially if even your staff hasn't heard of it before. Coco Caban? Say again. The Coco Van. Coco is something you drink at night. <laughs> Coco Van. Coco Van. Now, brothers Cal and Peter had taken over the restaurant from their parents, who'd owned it for 25 years. Cal stepped up to handle the kitchen, while Peter took care of the front of house. Or at least that's what it said on their resume. But despite the separation, they still had plenty of time to fight, to the extent of going months without talking. Now, here's something intriguing. The parents might not have known about the show being Kitchen Nightmares when they initially signed up for it. So, did nobody care to explain to them what was about to happen, or did the brothers barely ever talk to their parents? Well, there's plenty to speculate about, but I found this Facebook post talking about the episode where Patty said, They told us it was a renovation show, then at the last minute it turned into Kitchen Nightmares. Patty signed off casually with her name and mentioned that it was all good and even fun to do. I mean, considering Ramsay and the team gave the restaurant the facelift of a lifetime, I can't see her getting mad about it. Anyway, coming back to the episode, the Bel Air Diner might have thought that having a huge menu made it more appealing, but in reality, it was one of the reasons it was going downhill. Ramsey put it best. The menu could rival an encyclopedia, and adding items like Cocao Vien wasn't helping them either. Speaking of, Ramsey had a pretty good way of putting that too. First time for me, Cocker van in a diner. Like, seriously, what could go wrong, right? Well, a lot more than you'd expect. Oh my god, that is a slurry of Why would anyone attempt to do something so fine dining in a diner? The chicken wasn't even freshly cooked. The portion size was too big, and the chef absolutely butchered it. So, Ramsay had a suggestion. And the Cocker van, someone needs to go back to France. I'll pay for the flight. No I'm good. Sorry. But guess what? Cal was just as confused. Coca Vin? Coca, Coca Van. I'm not really sure how to say it. So, why have it on your menu at all? Anyway, this is when Ramsey noticed there was one person missing in the restaurant, and that was Peter. And where was he at? Well. He's at his fiance's place, at another restaurant. Yeah, Peter was supposed to be helping run the place, but apparently he thought chilling at his fiance's was a better use of his time. What's even more shocking is that he was still getting paid. Cal revealed that their parents insisted on giving Peter a $50,000 allowance every year from the diner's earnings. For doing absolutely nothing, apparently. Meanwhile, Cal had his own family and a baby at home and was practically living at the diner. Not hard to believe it was taking a toll on him. I sleep here. <laughs> you have a baby at home, young man, and you sleep here? Poor guy. Yeah, he had to have been feeling trapped. And when Peter finally bothered showing up, Ramsey couldn't help but spot the fancy Rolex on his wrist. I'm walking into your mum and dad's restaurant with a nice big chunky Rolex on. Why aren't you feeling better than that? I don't know. You don't know? Okay, so this guy clearly had an attitude problem. I'm not crazy for pointing that out, right? Well, either way, Ramsey had his work cut out for him. Putting the family back on the right track was just as important as slimming down the menu to just one page. When Ramsey rolled in later that day, right off the bat, he spotted some food on the pass that wasn't looking quite right. He turned to Archie for an answer, who had this to say. Is this what you opened 25 years ago? This? No. No. Well, points for honesty. Later, Ramsey sat down with a customer to get some feedback. 
Turns out, the cheese on their grilled cheese sandwich wasn't even melted properly. Ramsey offered to take it back to the kitchen, thank God, but it was pretty clear that the place's standards had taken a nosedive. These guys need to wake up quickly, huh? It's the fan. Now, before we follow Ramsey down into the basement, and believe me, you're gonna need this second to get ready for it, here's something you should know. It was once seen as the landmark of Astoria, and it served some pretty famous people like Jerry Seinfeld and Howard Stern in the past. So, at a place that rubs shoulders with legends, you'd expect at least halfway decent hygiene, right? Is this for real? Well... Turns out, in October 2022, the city got involved and shut them down because of pest conditions. They reopened after a thorough cleaning, but what Ramsey saw honestly makes me wonder what the point of it was. Plus, Ramsey didn't even know what half of the stuff was. There was pastrami cozying up next to chicken, wet, stinky chicken at that. Even the chicken's dropping at the mouth, and it's dead. <laughs> Nothing was labeled or even stored properly. Calling it a mess doesn't do it nearly enough justice. Ramsey immediately slammed the brakes and sent all the customers home before somebody got killed. And after 14 long years, we finally got to hear a classic Ramsey line once again. Shut it down. And here's something you've never heard from a restaurant owner in the entirety of the show's history. It's, it's on me. It's on me. It's I, not on you. That's no, it's 100% on me. I'm here the most. It's my fault. All of this. That was honestly pretty mature, right? Getting on the same page is only half the battle. To be a hit, any restaurant worth its salt has to figure out how to get everyone working together to serve up great food consistently. But you know what's strange? They didn't show us another look into the basement after the renovation. Viewers, potential customers no less, had to know whether they cleaned the dungeon or not. Because honestly, after seeing that catastrophe, I'd need some pretty big assurances to go anywhere near the place. Bel Air took matters into their own hands and posted a little something on their Instagram to show off the changes they made. Still, not everyone was convinced. They also posted this meme saying they got rid of their infamous Kokao Veen. They also posted a video thanking their patrons. It's not easy having people see us at our worst. Obviously, a lot is exaggerated for television, but having Gordon yelling at us gave us a jolt to improve and implement better practices. But what about the customers? A person with the username Road to the Snow took to Reddit to share their experience after the show aired. He wrote, Went there yesterday morning to see if the owners really changed their ways. Place was empty, except for one older man having a coffee at the counter. But behold, the old menu is back. <sighs> a tale as old as time. A bunch of Yelp reviewers weren't too thrilled either. One person ordered takeout to celebrate the episode and ended up with bacon, even though they couldn't eat pork. And what was the restaurant's response? Be happy you got free bacon. God, I don't even know where to begin on that one. Another customer had a bit of a health scare, claiming they were served chicken that was completely pink at the center. So what does this mean? Have things gotten worse at the diner? If someone's in the neighborhood, pop by and let me know. I'm genuinely curious. Anyway, let's keep rooting for them. Changes take a little time. We can only hope they take the customer's feedback seriously and start moving in a better direction. But while I was doing my usual pre-video research, I came across this post. It read, Gordon will not be there, thank God. His food does not compare, and he is a complete asshole. Huh, but who is this Steve Baskinger? Turns out, he's the co-owner of Basque 46, the restaurant that featured in the second episode of the latest season. Guess I could have figured that out from the name, huh? When someone asked if Ramsey is really like his TV persona, Steve said that he was, quote unquote, horrible. Looks like we got another owner firing back at Ramsey for his no-nonsense approach, huh? And this is only the second episode. 
but are we honestly surprised? Basque 46 in Woodland Park, New Jersey is owned by Steve, the guy from before, and Sandy. But here's the kicker. This family-run gastropub has been in the business for only six months, but the owners have been life partners for 25 years. But you know what? This episode is less about them and more about this dude right here. Well, meet the most controversial figure to appear this season so far. I'm Bobby. Not only am I the chef, but I'm the culinary gangster. To me, he's like a mix of Sammy from ABC and Joe Nagy from that infamous bistro. In other words, not the kind of person you'd want to do business with. I'm not formally trained, but I am from the school of hard knocks. He didn't even know the basics of cooking, flavor, or food safety. A real winner of a hire, huh? Sometimes I think these guys are playing a character. Like, how delusional can you be? According to Bobby, he was the shining star of the restaurant. And the problem? Well, clearly it wasn't him. Or so he thought. Now, this dude couldn't handle a single ounce of criticism. Gordon Ramsay's here. If he doesn't love my food, then you know what? He could kiss my ass. So, it should go without saying how he got on with Ramsay. And to make matters worse, the guy was abusive and threatening too. I don't know if you realize I'm the one with the knife. Stop the we do our job. Yes, we turn around and do it. So why keep him around in the first place? But him just being there wasn't the worst part. Guess how much he's been making. What you paying me here? 100,000. Holy Yeah, my jaw's on the floor too. He was getting 50% more than other chefs in the area and has done absolutely nothing to prove that he's worth it. Now, I don't know about you, but I prefer printed menus. I mean, seriously, just put them back on the table. No more QR code BS, please. Our code does not exist. Oh, um, we could go to the Basque website and it should show up. <laughs> I'm here for lunch. I know. Not an IT meeting. <laughs> they are and will always be a complete hassle. But complaining aside, let's get to the service. Every dish seemed to come with a chive stalk as a garnish. A bit excessive, right? As for the mac and cheese, it was more like mac and grease. It had a ton of raw onions and a big old dollop of store-bought sauce on top. The wings were a train wreck and the tacos were completely overloaded. The portions were so massive that they were more overwhelming than exciting. But once the food was returned to the kitchen, Bobby decided to retaliate. He's probably got a small package and that upsets him, so he wants to take it out of my tacos. I've never seen someone expose themselves like this. It's gotta be the worst case of projection I've ever seen. And get this, in his LinkedIn bio, he advertised himself as an employer's dream employee. More like an employer's nightmare. And there's more. He wrote, My personality and hospitality is what separates me from most candidates. You say that, buddy, but this is you, right? Who's this for? Mr. Ramsey. Okay. Take it and shove it up your... Imagine sending your business card in a passive-aggressive attempt to rile up Ramsey. This level of immaturity honestly puts him up there in the KN Hall of Infamy. I'd compare him to people like Sebastian any day. But we know Ramsey. He always knows what to say. Fortunato, otherwise known as culinary gangster. Right, it's a spelling mistake. Bobby Unfortunato. <laughs> Need he say more? What made this entire situation even more controversial is that the owners who were working there seven days a week weren't paying themselves a salary. On top of that, they were losing $15,000 a month with Bobby and the team of cooks he personally hired. Yep, he had five line cooks working for him. Outrageous, right? Anyway, we've all heard the term fresh frozen in kitchen nightmares before, but you aren't ready for this. Maybe partially homemade, and you can't partially. That's how he described his famous cheese sauce, his specialty. Cheese whiz. And that's his secret to making six figures in the restaurant industry. But for those of us who dare question him, Bobby has a message for us. Let's get one thing straight. Six days a week, no benefits, no 401k. I ran the kitchen. I did the inventory, ordering, negotiating with vendors. The owner had nothing to do with the kitchen because he has no clue about the kitchen. And you better take him seriously because he's playing the Godfather theme in the background. Ooh, watch out, you guys. We got a badass here. This is the same guy who is clueless about the inventory and restaurant expenditures, just so we're clear. 
He admitted that he only cleaned the floor in the walk-in fridge. Meanwhile, there's a treasure trove of inventory just sitting there, slowly rotting away into the world's most expensive trash heap. A hundred thousand was the correct amount. I don't, I can't retire, so I have to make what I have to make. But hey, thankfully, for the sake of everybody's sanity, he has since retired. And he admitted this just two seconds later. You people don't understand, this rent restaurant industry sucks. That's why I retired. That's quite a lot of allegations. Hope this doesn't turn into another Oceana Grill fiasco, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> Lost it! <clears throat> Excuse me, still getting over a cold. Now, here's a question for you. Imagine if your boss made you work yourself to death. I'm talking three weeks straight without a single day off. No compensation. Would you quit? This brutal situation was faced by the employees of The Drink. Their owner, George, could be best described as this. How do I know you're deluded? Yeah, because you're dreaming. How, what do I'm dreaming? I you're watching staff put food in the microwave. Not only did he mistreat his employees, but guess what? He didn't even bother showing up most of the time. He doesn't know what's going on in his restaurant because he's not here most of the time. The restaurant, also located in New Jersey, exists as part of a country club golf course. You might think it's super posh because of its high-end clientele. Well, you couldn't be more wrong. The food, to nobody's surprise, was way below average. But don't blame the chef just yet. My man Carlos was way too overworked. We don't have a head chef officially. The staff was way undervalued here too. How long did you work without a day off? I don't remember that. I can only imagine the emotional and physical exhaustion Carlos went through. You okay? Not really. Huh? I'm feeling, I'm, I'm feeling good, but I need to, to continue. He was burnt out, but it's always nice to see Ramsey stand up for the staff. You can't just beat them seven nights a week Wait. like you don't care. But George is as ungrateful as they come. He just couldn't understand that Ramsey was here to help. Another thing that was a bit off-putting to me was that George kept his wife and co-owner in the dark about the finances. How, how high are the bills? It's gonna be, you know. Okay, just us. throw a number. Where's the trust, man? She deserves to know. Then, something terrible happened. Ramsey and the rest of the crew stumbled upon something really gross and disturbing. I mean, imagine going out to eat and finding... Well, the sort of stuff that you'd never want to see in your food. We're talking about human hair. Table just sent back these because they found a hair in their nachos. This restaurant seriously needed a major reality check. Someone with the username DabRat70 on Reddit shared that their two daughters went on a casting call for the drink. Get this, they were told to wear appropriate attire for a golf course, or at least be dressed nicely. So they each received a free entree, but had to pay for their drinks. During dinner, the producers came around and asked if there were any problems with their meal. Theirs was fine, but the table near them said their salmon was raw. And they were kinda prompted what to say, so Ramsey would come over to their table. No, dude, that's, that's raw. This is raw. Yeah, dude. Prompted, huh? What do you make of that? But listen to this. I mean, I've seen a lot of disasters, but tonight, that was one for the record books. Yeah, but we've seen far more disastrous, dirty abominations in the past. Yeah, George had some problems, but was he the worst owner we've ever seen? I don't think so. <laughs> with the culinary gangster. Be careful how you approach me. What the f going on here? They're on the food. They send it back. Smell it! I feel awful. I feel awful. Like I feed my daughter from here. <laughs> Kitchen Nightmares is no stranger to people absolutely butchering every health and safety standard out there. I don't think I'm making any waves by saying that. But these kitchens were so bad, they had Ramsey reconsidering his decision to come back with a new season of the show in the first place. Yep, these are the grossest kitchens we've seen so far in season 8. Alright, let's see what's going on over at Basque 46 in Woodland Park, New Jersey. So, this gastropub ran into trouble just six months after throwing its doors open to the world. The restaurant is owned by Steve and Sandy the power couple who had been together for more than two decades, running bars and other joints all the while. 
After a string of successful business ventures, the couple were looking forward to kick off their biggest restaurant yet. But unfortunately, their house of cards came tumbling down. While Sandy spent all of her hours at the restaurant desperately trying to get things back in order, Steve chose to hide in his so-called office instead of, you know, trying to fix things. But the blame didn't lay squarely on his shoulders. Because here comes the real failure, I mean, man, of the hour. You with the culinary gangster. Be careful how you approach me. However, when Ramsey showed up, viewers were quick to notice how Chef Bobby's gangster facade started to crumble. So, who's the real gangster here, huh? Ramsey had to dig deep and bust out the patience of a saint just to last two seconds near this guy. But here's the real truth of the matter. Tensions were so high that it left Steve's health on the line. My investments are, are, are blown away. I put over a million dollars into this place. I don't want to go bankrupt. Steve was sweating buckets, literally drowning in business expenses, and questioning his life choices. But now, let's talk about the kitchen. There, Chef Bobby was the only one who called the shots. Watch the temperatures on them. Every steak was messed up yesterday. Because you're aggravating the out of them. What a chef to get on the kitchen. The dude loves spending money, but guess what? No one was keeping tabs on where the dough was going. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that this is how Steve saw him. Chef Bobby is the kitchen nightmare. Steve, kitchen don't even talk. It's one thing to deal with difficult owners, but it's another thing entirely to deal with an arrogant chef. Ramsey definitely had his hands full. And things were already off to a terrible start with the QR code at the entrance. So no menus? No, just the QR code, yeah. We don't have menus. Right. This QR code does not exist. They redirected customers to a website where they had to practically go through a maze just to get to the menu. Because who'd want to make things easier on their customers, right? What's more, for a restaurant who claimed everything was homemade and authentic, the mac and cheese was loaded with fake as hell cheese sauce. I wouldn't call anything with cheese whiz in it my signature anything. Ramsey's disbelief was palpable. Onions are raw, the flavor's terrible. And they're saying it's a signature cheese sauce, so it must be homemade, but it tastes like... So Ramsey arrived at a conclusion. Management was clueless about basic business knowledge. And to make things worse, accountability was out the window. Come to me and give me the review, man to man. Oh, now for the reason we're all here. The inventory was rotten. In the freezer, the nightmares inside the thing were straight out of a horror movie. What is this with Bobby? He's earning more money than you and your wife put together. Yes, he is. A hundred and, grand. And that, and that kills me. The salary for an exec chef in this area, uh -huh. 70 grand tops. But he's not even delivering 50% of what you're paying for. Yep, that's a frozen chicken swimming in a tub of batter, all on its own. But wait, there's more. Man, that chicken must have stunk to high heaven for Ramsey to have reacted like that. Not even the fruits or veggies were spared from the aura of decay sitting over the place. And well, Ramsey was left with no other option but to shut down the restaurant, for obvious reasons. And then, it was time to lay down the law. Ramsey ordered them to clean up their act, literally and figuratively. And the whole team needed to step up and face the music. This. This is where your money's going, right here. Meanwhile, Steve finally realized it was time to take charge of his business. I can't start to help you guys if you're not prepared to help yourselves. With that, Ramsey and his squad revamped the patio and added a fresh new menu to liven things up around the place. It was small, simple, and dynamic. There's gonna be no more wasting money on oversized portions here, thank you very much. During the relaunch, people were digging the new flavors, especially the chicken wings. Those tacos look great. Thank you. The way this kitchen is functioning is night and day. Thank you. Early start. But Bobby was having a complete meltdown, which I'm sure absolutely made Ramsey's day. Seven all day. Uh slammed right now, and I just, you don't understand, it's just a lot. Rapido, rapido, rapido. 
But despite the rocky start, they pulled through. And they ended the night on a high note. Ramsey left them with some words of wisdom and encouragement, all wrapped up in an ultimatum. Prove yourself in 30 days, or pack your knives. As for Bobby, well, some things never change. Middle of dinner service. I want to see if we had a good start. The problem now, the wheels are falling off, and Bobby's reverting back to his old ways. Banging food out, and sadly, he's not communicating. He's just shut down. But we've barely even waded into the shallows here, because what went down at Bel Air Diner? Well, if you know, you know. Either way, the siblings running the place, barely even speaking to each other, definitely wasn't putting their best foot forward. But Ramsey was here, aiming to return the place to its former glory as the hottest spot in Queens. But the only thing that was on the menu was... Uh, hold on, my joke is definitely somewhere in this phone book of a menu. Seriously, how many items were on there? Ramsey lost count, and he wasn't even halfway through. Right, appetizers, homemade wings, page three, we're just on the cellar bar. It's like an encyclopedia, this thing. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there is one thing a diner can never go wrong with. A solid cup of joe. But what Ramsey got just wasn't what he was expecting. <sighs> Jeez Louise. And, well, the food didn't do them any favors either. The tortellini were store-bought, and the lobster, which was supposed to be fresh out of the tank, was raw, mushy, and just rancid. It is. That lunch was shocking. I mean, really bad. Oh, that well. The lamb wasn't looking like any lamb Ramsay had seen before, and the fries had mysterious black bits in them. Ramsay was so upset that he decided to skip dessert and get down to business right away. Did that end up being a mistake? Well, you tell me. Cal came over for a reality check, and Peter, um, the dude was MIA. And, well, once he did show up, Peter had his own justification for never showing up. I don't feel like I'm respected as, as a, a brother. Are you unappreciated here? I feel I am, yes. But they had to put petty things like that aside and start working towards reviving the business. Or things were gonna get pretty hairy. Tonight is both you running this place. I want to see it in operation, okay? See you shortly. Cut to the dinner service, and Ramsey was shocked. The chefs couldn't even dish out a simple burger. God, this is not a fing joke. That's ice cold and it's raw in the middle. These guys need to wake up. But while that train wreck of a service was rolling along, Ramsey decided to let them stew for a bit and go inspect the basement in the meantime. Whether or not him skipping dessert was a mistake, going down into that hellhole of a basement definitely was. Brace yourselves, because what you're about to see is genuinely that disgusting. Fans of the show just haven't been able to let the topic go ever since the episode aired. But this was a place where produce went to die. There was stuff that had been there for weeks, not days. And to make things worse, there was absolutely no logic behind the way things were stored. <laughs> like, honestly, it was a legitimate death trap. They should have been handing out hazmat suits to anybody who walked by on the streets, let alone dared to walk into the restaurant. But Ramsey put it best, calling the place a ticking time bomb. Now, did you see the chicken? It was just casually chilling in that nasty, slimy water like it was no big deal. And those meat trays? Wide open. And who knows how long they'd been sitting there exposed to the elements. But the oil, oh boy the oil. Ramsey wasn't kidding when he said it was a ticking time bomb. The place could have gone up in flames at a moment's notice with all that grease caked up in there. So Ramsey had to act fast before they literally blew everybody up. All off. All off. Shut it down. That's gotta be the worst. It was time for the brothers to take responsibility. You can't just keep passing the buck and expect things to magically turn around all on their own. At this point, the fate of the restaurant was at stake. Ramsey took the opportunity to make that abundantly clear. The practices down there are shocking. And I'm talking produce that is gone. Weeks gone. Not days. The place was quite literally their family's lifeline. 
it was time they paid more attention to what had been going on there for all their sakes. Smell it! I feel awful. I feel awful. Like I feed my daughter from here. <coughs> Ramsey wasn't gonna leave without setting them straight first. He asked the brothers to bury the hatchet and work like a team. The dream was to pass on their legacy, but it seemed like they were losing sight of it. We're building this business three decades ago. It was your dream to pass this on. Ramsey then decided to show them the ropes of how a real well-oiled restaurant runs. And to do this, he took the brothers over to Times Square to show them how things should be working, efficiently and effortlessly. And hygienically, let's not forget hygienically. Fast forward a bit, and the diner had a whole different vibe. A retro look, making the diner shine. The decor was fixed, the menu was trimmed down, thank God, and Ramsey kicked things off. It was time to rock and roll. You $18,000 Senesso espresso machine. However, during the dinner service, the kitchen hit a roadblock almost immediately, and Ramsey wasn't thrilled. What the f going on here? It's raw. Hey, it's raw. Finally, Peter stepped up, and Cal handled the front of house, eventually managing to finish strong. Generation. You want something else? I can get you something. Giving mum and dad a well-earned retirement. Not a bad start to a whole new story, eh? Anyway, we've jumped from New Jersey to New York so far in this video, so how about we jump back to the good old Garden State again? Let's take a look at this golf course joint in the drink, run by George and Solange since 2017. On the outside, the joint was pulling in a crowd of up to 80,000 golfers. But you wouldn't know that once you walked into the actual place. If, uh, you can find it, that is. Where the hell's the sign? In the drink. I'm in the dark. Is, is this it? It's a gloomy vibe all around in the decor. There was no decor, actually. I was just admiring your patch. My renovation, you like that? That's do I like it? What do you think? It looks stupid. Oh, that's a first. As for the food, it wasn't taking home any awards, not by a long shot. It looks like he had given up, and to make things worse, the co-owners were clueless about the place's finances. You see, George might be a nice guy, but he wasn't the best boss. He was hardly around and cared so little about what was happening in his own restaurant, he may as well have not been there at all. Meanwhile, Nadia, the unsung hero, did everything she could to keep the ship from sinking. All right, so when Ramsey walked in, and trust me, it took him a while to do that, he felt lost. There were no signs, nothing to point him in the right direction. Oh dear. <sighs> this place looks bleak. He sat down for a taste test, and this is where the actual drama began. The chicken was too dry, and the quesadilla was hard to swallow. But this was the worst of them all. They're on the food? They sent it back. Oh my God. But I'm not even done yet. Caesar salad, bland. Burgers, overcooked. I didn't even think it was possible to be more disappointed, but here we are. Meanwhile, the staff was just watching the meltdown unfold. It was like a train wreck they couldn't look away from. So Ramsey had been around this place for over an hour, and there was still no sign of George. Nobody knew where he was at, but turns out he'd been chilling in his office the whole time. Any news of the owner? Yeah, so I just texted George, and apparently he's been here in his office the whole time. And when they finally met, he had to get him on the same page real quick. The best thing about this restaurant? Yeah. Is the service. Great. Food was terrible. <laughs> but George was in denial. I mean, how bad could it be, right? But Ramsey was having none of it. <laughs> how can you say that? I mean, we do have a good food. Where is the good food? It was time to show the man how to run a business. He came up with a genius idea of having a drink cart on the golf course. Those carts are cash cows, some making up to a cool two grand a day. But oh boy, George was clueless about the potential gold mine he was sitting on. But in terms of the drink card, George definitely doesn't pay as much attention as needed. This viewer seemed to get the hint, and he knows exactly what to have on those cards. Wraps and sandwiches, the ultimate filling finger food for the hungry golfer. 
I hope you're taking notes, George. Anyway, Ramsey was back at the restaurant, ready to see how the place functioned during a busy dinner service. I, for one, was wondering how they were planning on actually getting butts in seats in the first place, but guess they figured it out somehow. George claims that he was the expediter on most nights, but you've got to see how his staff reacted to that claim. Here, most nights expediting, my jaw drop. That is a complete lie. Methinks we have a liar amongst us. George's wife was the real power on that front. Meanwhile, the food going out was all wrong. The sliders were too salty, the chicken not cooked, and the salmon may as well have still been alive. Soon, the kitchen was drowning with orders, and the ticket times were completely off the charts. When the food started coming back to the kitchen, Ramsey lost his patience, and George's so-called expediting skills were almost non-existent. He's just pulling them and putting them, and I had to take mine out from underneath all the tickets. Multiple. Yeah. The night ended in a failure of spectacular proportions. Ramsey shut down the kitchen, and the customers were sent packing. And who had to face the brunt of it? Carlos, the overworked chef. Yeah. I've removed line cook Carlos from the kitchen. He was beyond burnt out right now. George definitely wasn't taking the blame. When Ramsey confronted him, he simply lost it. You yes. don't understand. You are not listening. I don't understand. You're not listening. But hey, 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 Ramsey came back with a plan. He had a new trick up his sleeve. And he was going to hit the golf course again. Of course, with the food. Yeah, the on the golf course and really maximize on potential food sales. <laughs> These carts could bring in half a mil a year and George was sitting there in disbelief. What's more, after the crew worked their magic, the place went from looking like a funeral home to rivaling a legit country club. And the menu, finally, finally, pretty good. Have a beautiful clubhouse restaurant. We need the foods to be in keeping with the restaurant. No more boring combo platters. Ramsey brought in the big guns with honey glazed wings, sliders, burgers, and chicken Caesar wraps. The taste test went off without a hitch, and the kitchen was ready to rock it. Then came the big nut, where they needed to put that food in front of real customers. George was playing waiter, but you could tell that the dude had never worked anywhere near the hospitality industry before. The dude just needed to sit down and shut up, in my opinion. Meanwhile, the kitchen was rocking it. Thank goodness for that. In the end, Ramsey left with a strong message for George. The man needed to trust his team, delegate, and embrace the change. It was time to turn things around. Fast forward a bit, and in the drink was swarmed with customers. George was finally able to settle a few debts, and Nadia, now the manager, was running the show like a boss. As for Chef Carlos, he was living the dream with some well-deserved days off. And Ramsey's recipes? Well, I don't think I need to tell you how good his cooking is. This restaurant owner stirred up a storm after she did something absolutely insane. You did enforce a legal letter threatening to sue someone using that. Yep, she decided to sue her own customers. Well, step into the world of Denise Whitling's Cafe Hunt where insanity is just another part of everyday life. From victim playing to boasting one of the biggest egos I've ever seen, let alone on the show, Denise became the target of an entire town. They all hated her, but why? Well, let's take a trip down to Hampton, Maryland, just a hop, skip, and a jump from Baltimore, where we'll come face to face with Cafe Hunt. Now, you might be wondering, what's so special about this joint? Well, it's all in the name Hun. Yeah, you heard me right. Hun is like this town's secret code for friendliness. So when Denise opened her restaurant back in 92, she made sure to put that sign of universal hospitality in the name. I mean, sure, why not? Seems like a smart idea, but it turned out to be the root cause of all the problems the restaurant faced. You see, business was booming and Denise had some really big dreams. So she decided to cash in on Baltimore's favorite word of endearment in more ways than one. She not only trademarked Cafe Hun, but the word Hun as well. Yep, she went ahead and trademarked not only the name of her restaurant, but also the word Hun itself. 
and the locals went absolutely insane about it. And now, back to the restaurant itself. One of the servers, Janet, had quite a bit to say. And I don't think you're ready to hear this. She wanted to sell her mugs, her t-shirts, her little knick-knack things. Yeah, Denise came up with the not-so-bright idea of using her newly trademarked word, hun, on just about everything from mugs to t-shirts and put them all up for sale. Oh boy, it looks like she had just declared war on anyone who dared to utter the word hun without her permission. And yeah, that move didn't help her case either. Denise had Baltimore behind her, and then she announced that she trademarked Hun, and that ticked off a big portion of Baltimore. Suddenly, Denise became the final boss of Baltimore, and her lair, I mean business, was tanking faster than you can say Hun. Now, this is where it gets even juicier. Denise was frustrated, but what she did next stepped over the line. Since all this has started, Denise has taken out her frustration on her staff. She was laying it on thick with her staff, and they were under a lot of pressure. Greg, the head chef, believed that when a leader can't give clear direction, the food is going to come out of the kitchen tasting like cardboard. This is what we call in the business foreshadowing. She's going to run us down to the ground, and if Chef Ramsay doesn't come in, we're screwed. When Ramsay arrived in Baltimore, he got wind of the unusual rift Denise had with her clientele, and so he decided to do a little research on his own, which landed him at the radio station of all places. He was here with a single-minded goal of untangling the wild web of drama that had engulfed Cafe Hunt. And this is what he found out. I've only eaten there two or three times, but the food is, uh, is on the back burner. Yeah, can't say I'm surprised. And the folks at the radio were more than ready to unearth some dirt they had on her. She was threatening businesses with lawsuits. The lawsuits? She demanded legal fees from somebody that was making tourist stuff with just the word hun on it. Like, let me put this in perspective for you. Imagine trying to charge someone for saying howdy in Texas. Sounds dumb, right? Well, that's pretty much what she was trying to do here. And Ramsey's face said it all when he learned that little detail. But those disc jockeys weren't done yet. The people who were most offended were the people in that immediate neighborhood. Denise was locally known as the anti hun well, that's one name you wouldn't want to put on your resume. But Ramsey still had an obligation to try and save the day. But when he finally laid his eyes on the place, his reaction was pure gold. Look at the size of that thing. Wow, are you serious? Classic Ramsey. Anyway, once inside, he was greeted by Debbie, the manager, who was all smiles. But Ramsey had already started his investigation. How long have you been doing this? I have been here 13 years. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yep. There was no time to waste. Can I meet the owner? Can I have a quick sure. word? Sure. Please. Thank you. Then I need Denise. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for me. Yeah. But before going into anything much deeper, he had to first have a one-to-one -one with the lady of the hour, Denise. And this is what she had to say. Business, pretty much, was half of what it was last year. Denise claimed that she poured her heart and soul into the place, and even emptied her small IRA and sold her house. Everything was gone. But nothing could bring her business back to life. But wait, wasn't she the one responsible for it? I mean, the word hun is like the crown jewel of Baltimore, and Denise tried to put it in her pocket. What's more, from newspapers to radio and TV, we're all raining down insults on her like there was no tomorrow. But I mean, come on, what was she expecting to happen? I mean, I was afraid for my life. You felt that threatened? Yeah. Denise even claimed that she felt like her life was in danger. But Ramsey wasn't buying her version of the story, so he had only one thing to ask her. Why would they want to be so vicious to you? If they don't know me? Yep, she put up a really good act and tried to keep her darkest secrets from Ramsey. But if we know anything about Ramsey, he's a master of cutting through the BS and getting to the truth. So he straight up asked her this. I'm, I'm not aware of anything else I've done. Did you not sue anyone? I never sued anybody. Yep, Ramsey questioned if she had ever taken legal action. And what was Denise's reply? All well, she bluntly denied it to his face. Ramsey wasn't about to back down, though. He kept probing, but Denise kept clamming up. 
And at this point, a lot of fans of the show pitched in saying that Ramsey should have walked out the moment he realized how dishonest she was. But that's not Ramsey. He loves to deal with challenges head on, and Denise, well, a tough nut to crack, deserved as much of a chance as anybody else. I want to work with you, but make it very different for me when you don't tell me the truth. Denise was caught in a web of deception and tried to get all defensive, but Ramsey was seeing through her lies. I've done my homework before I got here. I did. I, you know See, what? you're not being fair now. This is when he laid down a ground rule. He only wanted the truth. Nothing but the truth. And what better way to start than with the food, right? But when he was handed the menu, a particular dish caught Ramsey's eye. Much better than mom's. Much better than mom's eat As in best than mom's at home. Strange name, huh? But when the food arrived, it was somehow worse than its hideous name revealed. How the hell do you start eating sandwich this way? I mean, it's quite no doubt. Oh boy. We're really in it for the long haul here, huh? What followed next was a bunch of stone cold shrimp that tasted like they had been partying in the fridge for over a week. But surprise, surprise, Denise masterminded the menu and she thought everything she was serving was perfect. Denise never thinks she's wrong. This is perfect. According to her, if something was on the menu for 20 years straight, it had to be good. To me, that reeks of, we've tried everything and we're all out of ideas, but uh, hey, you do you, girl. Anyway, Ramsey wasn't impressed, and he could see from a mile away that Denise was the problem. Meanwhile, back in the kitchen, there was a whole different story brewing. Go through the kitchen. Let's go and say hello and meet everybody. Hi, guys. Hello. Oh. Ramsey first met Emily and Greg, the head chef, and started to school them on comfort food. I mean, there was nothing comforting about this, that's for sure. I want to think of comfort food. I think of meatloaf and excitement. That's bland. Ramsey was looking forward to getting some honesty for once, and that's when Denise served him some on a shining silver platter. Season them and taste them before they go out? We do not season fries. You don't season fries? No, we don't. Yep, they never season their fries. Hey, here I thought my it's always the seasoning catchphrase only applied to Hell's Kitchen and MasterChef. Way to prove me wrong, Denise. The chefs here had absolutely no control over the food. Denise ran the entire show, and it was either her way or the highway. And guess what? Her overbearingness made the chef hate his job, and he didn't think twice before throwing her under the bus. You know, it's always, oh, I don't like it like this, you know, we... Who doesn't like it? Denise. Denise had issues, both inside and outside the restaurants, and at this point, Ramsey was surprised they were still open. Denise stood her ground, though, determined not to let anyone, including Ramsey, slow her down. So I guess she meant every word when she said this. I'm not gonna let anybody get in my way, including Chef Ramsey. Meanwhile, Baltimore was buzzing with the news that Ramsey was in town. And that evening, Cafe Hun's dining room was packed to the brim during rush hour. Leave it to Ramsey to help an entire city overcome their differences with a restaurant to get butts in seats, huh? But the only thing they were getting that night was drama a la Denise. Out of nowhere, she stormed into the kitchen shouting instructions. Debbie, I need your attention. Hello? Yes. This is asparagus, all right? Orders were piling up faster and faster. In the kitchen, well, it was in utter chaos. Plates of chicken were swimming in grease, and customers were sending them back almost as fast as they were going out. Then Denise pulled the ultimate move. She 86'd the entire menu. It was like watching a magician make dishes disappear. Abracadabra and dinner's gone. 86 biscuits you got. They don't like it. 86 the pot pie. 86 the catfish. As for Ramsey, well, he was exasperated with the whole ordeal. Looking for answers, when Ramsey had a chat with Greg, he revealed that this sort of thing was pretty common around here. And that wasn't all. No, there was still more. Gordon Ramsay has got to get through her thick skull. If she doesn't take his advice, we're not going to make it. You can almost feel their frustration through the screen. If Denise didn't change her ways, this place was doomed. And for the first time ever, Ramsay hit a roadblock. I, I, I don't know where to start. I'm sorry. But eventually, after stepping out for a breather, Ramsey was back, and he was back with a vengeance. Is a clear direction, and restaurants run. 
from the top. Denise was speechless, and for once, she seemed to be unsure of herself. But teaching her was gonna be a problem. Like, you can't exactly teach a cat how to bark. But will Denise finally get her act together? Or was Cafe Han a dead restaurant walking? Well, Ramsey was determined to get to the bottom of things, and that meant he had to give Denise a reality check. To do this, Ramsey gathered the staff for a meeting before Denise arrived, and urged them to be completely honest with her about everything. And, well, he didn't need to tell the staff twice. Denise, you, um, you're a rude bitch. They absolutely tore into Denise's reign of terror. With the employees, you're talking to them like Denise, you're the negative in the restaurant. And guess what? When she wasn't around, the joint actually ran pretty smoothly. But the moment she stepped in, everything went down the tubes. She micromanaged like it was nobody's business. And her favorite term was 86-ing everything on the menu. Fish and chips, 86 Steak, 86 Burgers, believe it or not, 86 But why didn't anyone stand up to her? Well, the answer to that is easy. They were afraid they'd get the boot. Denise was the queen of meat, and she held everyone's financial stability in her hands. And it was time to put the brakes on that behavior. Ramsey straight up told her that she was rude, negative, and making her staff feel like they weren't good enough. Bam! The truth bombs were finally dropping. You have to stop feeling sorry for yourself that nobody likes you. And what was her reaction? For once, she was the one who looked shocked. Although Denise displayed a weak moment with tears starting to flow, Debbie was skeptical about whether Denise would follow through with her promises. Denise tried to make amends, but Debbie wasn't buying it. But will Denise turn a new leaf, or were her tears the biggest crocodile tears in Kitchen Nightmares history? She seems sincere now, but I'm a little doubtful. Well, with that, Ramsey headed out to put his genius plan into action. He had sorted the issues inside the restaurant, or so he thought, and now it was time to fix its reputation in the community. Together with Denise, he rolled up to a meeting with some folks from the community who had more than a couple of bones to pick with her. But wait, there's more. Denise wasn't only working on trademarking Hun, she had also gone after the Maryland Transit Administration too. She basically had creative control over a governmental campaign, and the locals definitely weren't having it. Anybody who would like to use the word is at risk of receiving a cease and desist order. But here's the kicker. They weren't just complaining. They were boycotting Cafe Hun. And Denise finally got a taste of her own medicine. They are not gonna go use that restaurant. No way, ever. Ramsey urged her to finally, finally take some responsibility. And surprisingly, she actually agreed. Woo! Finally, a glimmer of hope. Anyway, now it's time for the big reveal. Ramsey had worked a miracle on Cafe Hun. Those hideous colors were out, and a new flavor of vibrance was instilled. The place finally looked like a proper spot to grab a bite. This beauty. Oh, <laughs> but wait, there's still more. Ramsey unveiled the new menu. Chili beef, hot crab dip, mini shrimp and crab rolls, Maryland crab cake, classic fish and chips, meatloaf wrapped in bacon, and more. And the food was real good too. Should go without saying with Ramsey at the helm, but figured I'd make it clear. The staff was thrilled, and Denise was over the moon. A new day was dawning on Cafe Hun. I am so happy. But what happened next was going to be the real game changer. Denise was on the radio, doing something she should have done long ago. Trademarking the word has not only almost killed me, but has just about killed the business. Yep, it was about time she owned up to her mistakes. And this time, Denise wasn't just saying sorry. She was making a big gesture of goodwill. And at that moment, it was as if the entire town of Baltimore breathed a sigh of relief. After the radio show, they also held a press conference, and Denise officially announced she was giving up the trademark. And well, much to her surprise, it felt like a weight lifted off her shoulders. I didn't mean to, to steal something or to take something, and I apologize. But the real magic happened in the kitchen. Ramsey and his team, along with Chef Greg, revamped the place from top to bottom. The staff was motivated, the food was top-notch, and the customers were flooding in for the first time in a long time. 
Denise was on cloud nine. She had gotten her life and her restaurant back. Couldn't have written a better fairy tale ending myself. But unfortunately, life isn't a fairy tale. Cafe Hun finally bit the dust on April 29th, 2022. After 30 long years of serving its customers, Denise finally decided it was time to hang up her apron and embrace a well-earned retirement. Well, maybe not a fairy tale ending, but hey, it could have been a lot worse. So, what do you think about this absolutely insane episode of Kitchen Nightmares? Got any other delusional owners? Or owners that came back in the second half to turn things around? Get in the comments and let me know. And before you leave, make sure to hit that like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. Also, don't forget to check out my latest video right here. It's even crazier.